then you see the rumours that happen to fit that landing spot, and then you go, well, that all makes sense. G'day, everybody. How are you going today? It is so good to see you. I do hope that you are super well. Today, we're going to talk about the latest around the web in cinematography and photography news. Not all of it, just the articles that have caught my eye. The Canon R5. There are strong rumours that the version 2 is not so far away. We're also going to talk about a really interesting video that Nikon has put out. And Sony's firmware, yet another camera's firmware, appears to be buggy. All of that and more in this episode. Alrighty, let's start off with the 2024 February SEPA numbers, which are up on last year. This year in February, 511,000 units have been sold, and that is up from 446,000 units the previous year. Now, some analysts think that the number of cameras that will be sold this year versus last year will be pretty much the same, which is around 6 million units. Whereas other analysts think that this year will actually be bigger. And I think there's some logic to that when we expect to see Nikon's XP7 mid-tier camera, hopefully arriving sometime this year, who knows, cameras like the R5 II and perhaps even the R1, and who knows what else we might see from Sony. Could there be an A12? Might there be an A75? Let alone Panasonic, Fuji. So anything could be happening this year, but I do think there's a lot of exciting cameras to come and they will attract people to purchase, people who've been holding off. Thus, it's fantastic to see the industry going up rather than down. That's certainly what all of us who love using cameras and using lenses and we love the whole process. We don't want to yield our photography to our smartphones. I certainly don't. Just like some people like to drive cars and some people like to fish and some people like to climb mountains, I love taking photographs with cameras and I don't want to have to do it with phones because there are no cameras in the future. So from my perspective, this is great news. Let me know what you prefer, your phones or your cameras in the comments below. That it looks like Nikon's 19mm tilt shift lens is now no longer being manufactured. We can see in certain Japanese stores that it is now discontinued. It is still available to purchase in other regions. Of course, there will be stock, there will be inventory on shelves, perhaps for years to come. What does this mean for new Z lenses? Well, we've often speculated and we often speculate on what Z lenses are next. Now, Nikon are not going to give us a lens roadmap anymore. They've said moving forwards that they want to surprise us with their lens releases. Well, that's absolutely what they did with the 28 to 400. So who knows what that means? Maybe, maybe in light of the 19mm no longer being manufactured for F mount, we will see a tilt shift, or there is a rumor out there on Nikon Rumors, maybe even two tilt shift lenses. What would be the most useful tilt shift lenses to come first? Would it be a 19mm? Would it be a 17mm? And perhaps something like the 45. I currently own the 24 and the 85. So maybe they might consider going at the widest end and indeed with the Z mount, hopefully we can go wider. So 16, 17 mil, and maybe they'll give us an 85 Z with the 45 coming later. I suspect, I could be wrong, but we may not get a 24. We may just get three ultimately across the tilt shift range, an ultra wide, a mid and a long for product photography. Certainly this lens is discontinued. Certainly we would expect them to be coming on the Z mount. It's a matter of which focal length. Who knows? And yes, even more firmware updates for the Z50 and the Z30. We've got 2.51 and 1.11 for the Z30. It's both identical for the two of them. Change the default values for the following settings displayed when connecting wirelessly. Encryption keys, and the password displayed after the camera's default settings are restored. That's it. Now, I can't go through this episode without touching on the rumored Z63 image that was posted on Nikon Rumors this week. I don't want to make a big song and dance about it. Look, we are not hearing any other noise or information about any other 
camera in the Nikon lineup coming next. If you consider all of the moons that have been aligning over the years and the fact that from my perspective, I think that mid-tier camera, the Z6, the Z6 II, that price point, we don't even have to name the camera, that price point, the middle of the market is probably what is most wanted and most needed at this point in time. Yes, I think there is space for a Z50 Mark II. Yes, I think there is space for a Z5 Mark II and other cameras. What's the camera that's going to probably sell the most units and thus be helpful for both Nikon? It's the camera that the highest number of people are waiting for. That would be my guess. What do we think of this picture? Well, it's interesting because it seems to be based upon the top here of a Z9 slash Z8. It's not exactly the same as what they look like, but it's similar. Now, based on some previous speculations that I've made, a Z6 III is probably more likely a mini Z8, just like a Z8 was a mini Z9. Maybe the setup that's on the top of the Z9 and the Z8, which is similar, as I said, maybe that is quite realistic. Maybe this is Nikon surprising us and teasing us. Nikon are absolutely fantastic at keeping these things secret. The bottom line is we don't even know if the Z6 III is real. So if we put that to one side and go, yes, we think that camera is coming and we think that camera is next. There have been a lot of specs released on Nikon rumors. Nikon has had a year like 2022 where they released one camera, which was the Z30. Then they had last year where they released two cameras, which was the ZF and the Z8. And I think the hardest piece of data that we have or collection of data that we have is the Z62 and the Z8 and the ZF. Now, if we imagine the Z62 is kind of what it's going to look and feel like, rumor says it might be a touch bigger. Great. And we look at the ZF for technology and then we look at the Z8 and we go, well, it can't be more than a Z8 because of the price point. And we also know when it came to the Z8 and the Z9, Nikon is bringing a great deal of technology to market at extraordinarily fair and reasonable prices from my perspective. I still think that the Z9 is the best flagship camera out there amongst all brands and it's the cheapest. Thus, if Nikon maintain that philosophy, we could get a very powerful Z6 III. We can see in between all of these elements where a Z6 III might land. So that's all hard data of where it, it, like it has to land within that spot. It has to land there, just based on everything we know. Then you see the rumors that happen to fit that landing spot. And then you go, well, that all makes sense. Based on experience, usually as we see more information about a particular camera, it tends to mean that it's coming. That seems to have been our experience in the past, but none of that matters because the rules can be changed at any time because this is all unofficial. I want to talk about a video that Nikon just put out called We Make Nikon. It's a video made in Japanese and it's sort of talking about how Nikon is created, how a Nikon products actually created. It's a bit more behind the scenes, which is something that personally I'd love to see a lot more of. And I still have my Nikon museum visit video coming soon to share a little bit of what I think about that subject. In that video, not only do I walk around the Nikon Museum, I also take a bit of a look at Nikon's semiconductor business and the fact that they make lithography machines, otherwise known as steppers. What's interesting in this video, at the very end of this video, you can see one of their machines. It's got a very specific long name that starts with NSR. You can just see how enormous this machine is. Now, this is a lithography machine. And what it does is it takes raw silicon and it's part of the process by firing lasers at the silicon then they can be etched in a separate process sensors and so on are made I, I, there's a few things that are interesting to me about this the first thing is these machines are enormous because it's the first time i've actually seen one with a human standing next to it so you get a sense of scale and it's clearly in a factory. It's clearly working and doing things. On the 18th of October, 2021, it appears to be an upgrade of the machine in this video, which is the NSR S636E, 
ARF immersion scanner. And it talks about the fact it's currently developing this next generation machine, which is an immersion scanner. That means it's actually done underwater. And this allows for a much higher overall accuracy and ultra high throughput to support manufacturing of the most critical semiconductor devices. Product sales are scheduled to begin in 2023. Now this industry is very secretive. I don't know if those machines started to be being sold last year. But Nikon's stating their state of the art. And at the end of this article, they talk about, of course, the fact that they're made for the silicon that we find in our smartphones, but also used for making sensors. The NSRS636E is well suited for cutting edge semiconductor manufacturing, including logic and memory devices and CMOS image sensor applications and more. So what I love about this little tidbit of information is Nikon make the machines that make sensors as well as semiconductors, as well as logic and memory devices. In real world terms, Nikon could make the machines that make the CPUs in their cameras, as well as make the sensors. And the reason I bring this up is, that, is simply because there's this ongoing echo chamber that Nikon don't make their sensors. Quite frankly, the more research I do and the more I find out, and it's tiny little pieces here and there because this whole industry is so secretive, is that it's probably highly likely that Nikon's own machine is part of the process of making their sensors. And not only do they design their own sensors and the color arrays which go on top, and the logic of how their raw files are processed. Also the logic on the back of their sensors, which is where is the RAM? How fast is the RAM? How do we get the information off each photo site into the RAM, out into the CPU and into the storage and into the EVF? All of that is Nikon's pipeline. They may well also be exposing the silicon with their lithography machines that makes their sensors. I think it's super critical that we're all aware that Nikon make the machines that are a large part of making sensors, CPUs, memory, and more. If you do a Google of foundries, companies that make CPUs and memories and sensors, there are a lot, and there are some that specialize in very specific things. And for example, RED, to the best of our understanding, and again, I've done a lot of research, RED sensors are not made by Sony. And my point of bringing that up is there are other companies capable of creating great image sensors. And there is one more giant example in the room, which is Canon. They have also been making image sensors for years. There's just a lot of food for thought in all of this information, but I think it's important that we don't succumb to the echo, some of the echo chambers that are out there when it comes to Nikon and their sensors. Firmware releases for the A7S III, the A1, the A7 IV, and the A93. Now the A93 firmware is not out yet. It was still a month away, even so it was announced. Now we did have the A1 firmware release, which has been pulled due to bugs. And now this week we're hearing there are bugs generated for some users from the A7S III. These things happen, yes, it's true, but it's not great. Someone had a go at me, I think, for not being negative enough about it. I don't particularly want to judge it one way or the other. I think we all know, without me needing to say it, that it would be preferable if firmware updates shipped that simply worked. Now, as I said before, this does happen, but in light of the fact that Sony customers have been waiting a very long time for these firmware updates, for example, the A1 is now over three years old, and this is the first major update in three years. So look, it is frustrating for Sony users. And, you know, I genuinely think, and again, I'm not trying to create a storm here. I genuinely think, for example, Fuji and Nikon's strategy towards firmware is different Sony's strategy, I think, is more traditional strategy that we saw from Nikon and Canon in the past, which was release the finished product and you'll get firmware updates for minor bug fixes and maybe some features. And I think to create a platform like Nikon has done with XP7, that needs to be many, many years in the making. And it needs to start from the ground up, from the design of the very cameras. 
Nikon's Z9 strategy is probably years in the making. We have read in articles that they didn't necessarily know how far they were going to take it, but they've created a platform seemingly that can allow for firmware updates and continually adding features. How far that can go, we just simply don't know. But we do know that there's a lot of little things that are probably possible, as opposed to big things like auto capture, which seems like a whole separate interface. I don't think the current generation of Sony cameras are going to be able to have the same level of firmware updates that we're potentially seeing with the Z9, Z8, and whatever else might happen. I just don't think that was ever their plan. These firmware updates, the fact that two of them are now buggy, the fourth one's not even here yet, I think just shows us just wasn't part of their master plan. And that's what they've done in the past. They have shipped cameras at such a fast rate. Let's keep in mind that the A7R came out in 13, 2013. The A7R5 is from last year, 10 years later. So they got five models out in 10 years. That's an extraordinary pace. The A7 IV, we would expect an A7 V potentially this year again, five models in 11 years. That's an extraordinary pace. You s and at that sort of pace, you kind of don't need to bring new firmware to your customers to give them new features. You don't need to do it, but your customers might like it because it makes your camera less valuable when it's superseded suddenly, but it makes your camera more valuable if it keeps being updated. What's good for Sony might not be so good for their users. And it's possible Sony users jumped generations. I'm certainly one of those people. I went for the A7R and then I went for the A7R 3 I didn't bother with the two because there just wasn't enough in it. It'll be very interesting to see how Sony handle this moving forwards, but obviously these firmware updates will be rectified and re-released at a later point in time. That has not been announced at this point. The D6 has also received a firmware update this week, version 1.60. We can see this is the first update since 2022. In this update, we go from 1.51 to 1.60. Oh, it's a fairly minor update which includes GNSS module firmware update is now available. The firmware for the GNSS module has been updated, improved acquisition performance when used in certain areas where the quasi zenith satellite QZSS can be acquired. Also, changed the default values for the following settings displayed when connecting wirelessly encryption keys, and the password displayed after the camera's default settings are restored. This is what we saw in the Z50 and the Z30. That's it. Let's move on to the latest figures from Japanese camera stores. And we have even more camera stores. We have five camera stores that we can see the latest figures from February, not March. So this does not include the new blockbuster Fuji, but it's more stores from February before that camera shipped. At Yodobashi camera, we have the Nikon ZF, Nikon Z8 at number one and two. Then we have the Sony a7R5, the Sony a7C2, and the a7 IV at three, four, and five. Big camera, the Nikon ZFC, the Canon EOS R50, the Nikon Z50, the EOS R10, and the Olympus Pen. Now, Big obviously sells more entry-level cameras because they are all entry-level, and Sony is not to be seen there, which is interesting to me. Camera Kitamura, Fuji X-T5 at number one, Nikon ZF at two, OM Systems OM-1 Mark II at three, Sony ZV-E10 at number four with the zoom lens kit, and Nikon Z30 double zoom kit at number five. In these first three stores, Nikon is the only company that has two showings in all three of them. Otherwise, it's a mixed bag. Map camera, we have the Nikon Z, OM-1 Mark II at 2, the Sony a7C at 3, the Fuji X-T5 at 4, and the Nikon Z8 at number 5. So again, Nikon is appearing twice in the top 4. And then in this final one, which is Fujia Camera, OM Systems Mark II, the OM-1 Mark II is at 1, the Nikon ZF with the 40mm Special Edition kit is at 2, the ZF is at 3, the Z8 is at 4, and the OM System with a kit is at 5. 
There is no Sony or no Canon at all at that store. Nikon has a minimum of two cameras across all five stores. No other camera manufacturer does that, doesn't even get close. And for example, Sony only appears in three of the five stores. Now, why is this interesting? Well, yes, I will repeat that the Fuji X100 Mark VI or V1 hasn't shipped yet with these figures and it would change them again. Absolutely. Absolutely. But this, it doesn't change the fact that this is real data based on prior to that. And it really is showing that right now, Nikon are very strong. And I'll be really interested to see what the year figures look like because we're just getting some really strong numbers out of Japan here. Now this is just Japan. What we'll do is we'll just stick a pin in this one and we'll circle back to it in the coming months to see if Nikon keeps up the pace. But in light of our conversation about hopefully their mid-tier Z6 II replacement, hopefully it's coming soon, oh God, hopefully, then this could change the equation even more. But what we can see here is that it's the center, it's the kind of entry to the center of the pack, which is the majority of the cameras. You know, we see the ZF a few times, but as high as the Z8. So this means to me, what this says to me is a Z6 II, a new one, at that sort of price point, if it rocks, it's going to be, well, it's going to be a big seller. Now, Canon Rumors is, uh, look, there are a lot of rumors out of Canon Rumors and they just keep coming. And quite frankly, a lot of them don't come to fruition when they're talking about cameras, specifically the R5 II and the R1. Those cameras, especially the R1, has been talked about literally for years now and there is still nothing concrete at all. I say all that so you can take this next statement with a grain of salt, which is as big or as small as you would like, although I do think the impetus to get new gear out for the Olympics is bigger than any other year. And that is that the R5 II may well ship in June or July of this year. And that is only less than two months, three months away. I really hope for Canon users that something high-end happens this year whether it is the R1 or the R5 II, I, I, I really think it'd be a good thing to get something else out besides the huge range of entry-level and mid-tier cameras that they've put out in the last year or two. So many that I can hardly keep track of them. R10, R6, R8, R7, R50, R100. Did I miss any? So many. I don't even know all their specs. Canon, let's make those rumors come true and bring us an R5 II and an R1. Bring them both for the Olympics. That'd be cool. And finally, I want to close out this episode with a camera that was actually talked about a little over six months ago, but it didn't come across my desk. And I do think it's worth talking about now, which is the camera that shot the images for the Sphere, which is a performance space in Las Vegas that was launched by U2. There was a very special camera made which was 16,000 by 16,000 pixels. That's the sensor for this camera. It has some enormous specs. The Sphere Big Sky Camera Sensor is a 316 megapixel. It is square, three inches by three inches by seven and a half to eight centimeters in size. That's, that's a very big sensor and is natively HDR. It is capable of 40 times the resolution of 4K cameras. It can capture up to 120 frames per second in 18K square format, higher speed frame rates at lower resolutions. Sphere Studios has also developed image processing software to manage the uncompressed 60 frames per second raw footage, which is 30 gigabytes, not gigabits, or at 120 frames, 50 gigabytes to its custom 32 terabyte media mags. This is an astonishing camera with an astonishing sensor, with an astonishing pipeline. And these guys have made it bespoke 
for this performance venue. And there's every chance that it's made by one of those many other fabs that can make these sort of sensors. It's probably ridiculously expensive. It's probably so expensive it's kind of priceless. And because this sensor has been made bespoke for Sphere Studios and they would have been prototyping, so they would have made a number of them. Who knows how many are prototyped before you get one that actually works the way you want it to work. Maybe it's five, maybe it's 10, maybe it's 100. I'm not sure but it would be ridiculously expensive. Now, who makes this sensor? Well, who knows? But there's a very good chance it's not Sony because there are other people that can make groundbreaking sensors. And that's okay. Sony doesn't need to make everything. It's not a slight on Sony. It's just a matter of fact that there are other options and other talented companies out there all right, this has been lots of kind of big, hardcore industry news, which for me, I love. I find it really interesting understanding the mechanics and the backbone of how all of these things work. I run my own business and I produce my own products, so I actually care about the behind-the-scenes stuff, not just what happens out here in the public domain. It's so good to see you. I'd love your thoughts on all of this stuff. If this is your first time here, I'd love to see you again. So please do subscribe, please share, and please like. All right, bye for now.